Welcome and thank you for coming. I'm the Donna Marion Landis, the Associate Dean for External Relations at the Villanova School of Business. Thank you for attending the third annual Joseph Azraq Endowed Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, Joe Azraq is a 1969 VSB alumnus and he's also a member of the Daniel M. Zalella Center for Real Estate Advisory. And he's generously endowed this series to provide a forum for discussing topics on leadership, entrepreneurship, and social responsibility. Our guest of honor today fits all these criteria and many more. Before I introduce our, our speaker today, I want to recognize Sheila Clem. Where is she? Right here. Stand up, Sheila. VSB alumna and also a parent of VSB and a member of the university's board of trustees. And Sheila is responsible for Francine Lefrac being with us today. And lastly, I'd like to welcome to Villanova Francine's husband, Rick Freeberg, who's sitting in the back there. He's also with us today. Welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Francine Lefrac is an award-winning theatrical, television, and film producer, a successful entrepreneur, and a distinguished philanthropist. As a producer, Francine's work has drawn attention to social is issues of global significance including HIV, AIDS, conflict, and intolerance. Her films have been screened at major international film festivals, such as Cannes, London, Munich, Milan, and Sundance. And her productions have been recognized with Tony, Emmy, and Peabody Awards. In recognition of Francine's humanitarian efforts, she received the Women Together Award from the United Nations the Ellis Island Medal of Honor from the National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations, and the Human Spirit Award from the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. She's been named Women Who Cares by the United Cerebral Palsy and USO Woman of the Year, just to name a few. Her passion for art inspired her and co-chairs of the American Friends of Versailles to spearhead three charitable events that attracted 600 Americans to help finance the restoration of the Chateau's world-famous gardens and families. Her art and philanthropic affiliations also include serving as co-chair of the Patron Circle for the Guggenheim Museum, a member of the Contemporary Arts Council at the Museum of Modern Art, a member of the board of the Smithsonian Museum of American History, and a member of the President's Council of the Whitney Museum. And in preparation for this, I mean, I read everything I could about Francine on the internet. I could go on and on and on. Just one more thing I do want to mention, though. In 2008, Francine founded an organization called Same Sky, which is a socially conscious jewelry line that enables female artisans to achieve economic self-sufficiency. Same Sky's inaugural project in Kilgali, R Rwanda, provides employment to HIV-positive survivors of the 1994 Rwandan uh, genocide. Proceeds from the jewelry sales are reinvested into expanding the business to other regions of the world, spreading the Women Helping Women mission of Save the Sky. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our guest speaker today, Francine Lefrac. Thank you, Madonna. Um, I feel so lucky to be standing here with you today. Um, this is an incredible opportunity um, for all of us and to be at this idyllic university and have the privilege of getting a great education. Um, I feel like we're all incredibly lucky and lucky to have the kind of life we lead in this country. As we go about our daily lives, it's easy to forget or perhaps push aside the knowledge that there are people out there on this planet who will never have the opportunity in their life that so many of us take for granted. I never forget that fact, and I feel extremely lucky to be living in a way that does something about it. A great speaker once said, we can help, we can help everyone, but everyone can help someone. In 2008, I set out to do what I could to help the, woman, the women in Rwanda I took a real leap of faith, not by giving them a hand out, but by giving them a hand up. I'd like you to take a look at this piece um, to get a better sense. 
Kelly on cue. This is always the tricky part, you know, no, how mu no matter how much preparation. No matter how much we complain in this country, and we Americans love to complain, we should never forget really how lucky we are. Most of you in this room were babies when the Rwandan genocide happened. In the course of 100 days, over a million people were murdered, and 20% of the population was simply wiped out. It's hard to imagine so much sadness, so much loss, so much death. Yet what's more unfathomable 
unfathomable is the, pla the pain that was left behind in the hearts and minds of those who survived, especially Rwanda's women, most of whom were left with, with nothing and no village to remember them by. In the course of that genocide, women were used as weapons of war. United Nations estimates that 250,000 of them were raped and 70% of those women developed HIV. Um, the surviving women were left to support their children, many born from rape, and the orphans left behind by family members who did not survive. It is those women that I tried to help. It is those women that I'm now dedicating my work to empower women and eradicate poverty. And let me tell you, it's great work. In just over two years, the same sky, same sky has turned these women's lives around, but don't take my word for it. We can play in the other video. We can try to play the other video. the drama of playing the other video. Okay, well, it, we're gonna, why don't I keep going? As much as I try to give to these women, they constantly amaze me that I get so much back and that's what I wanna talk to you about today. When you're doing something you're supposed to be doing in life, it never stops giving back to you. When you follow your heart, and do the things you're supposed to be doing, you're taken on a very surprising and magnificent journey. In fact, yeah, we're getting any time. I just want to. Okay, well. And determination. Working every day gives me a reason to wake up and leave for my children because I am all they have. They lost so much. These are the survivors. Women who lived through the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. All have AIDS or HIV positive, but are slowly rebuilding their lives one blast bead at a time. The biggest surprise to me is how much the women have inspired me. Francine Lefrak has given the women the tools needed to turn their lives around. Through her company, Same Sky, the ladies learn how to crochet and make beautiful pieces of jewelry which are sold around the world. 100% of the net proceeds go back into the business, which started with four women and now employs yes. more than two dozen. They become very empowered and they get so much dignity and so much self-respect working with these other women that have suffered. Here in the capital city, the women for the first time are able to buy medicine, land, food, start their own businesses, and open up bank accounts. Jacqueline now pays for her daughter's education and bought her something she only dreamed of having for school. It's natural the way which she had gone to school for the whole semester, and all the other children had mattresses, and it had my daughter's films but she knew that we didn't have any money. And though they face an uncertain future, they're determined to provide for their families. When I'm gone, they will have a house. They will have something. Because I won't be here for long. That is their reality. The jewelry starts at about $40, and each piece comes with a tag showing the name of the woman who made it. And then you can actually email her and let her, let her know what you think. To find out how and where to buy the collection, log on to our website at 7online.com. Okay, we 
So when I was in college, I never dreamed I would be dedicating my life to helping women, women in Rwanda. I wasn't a social um, work major. In fact, I was an art history major. So how did I get here? I bet you're wondering. The answer is by following my passion, being true to myself, which meant being willing to change and grow, and a lot of hard work. That's the beauty of a lucky life. Each one of you has been granted. With hard work and perseverance, and authenticity. It is within your power to become whatever it is you truly want to be. And if you're anything like me, well, that can turn out to many things. Because first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur and I have a lot of compassion for people. So I'd like to share a few stories about the twists and turns of my journey that led me to Same Sky and share a few lessons I've learned along the way. Traditionally, the definition of an entrepreneur has been someone who organizes a business venture and assumes financial risk. But I see the definition of the word entrepreneur a little differently. In today's world, an entrepreneur refers to anyone who's willing to take a leap of faith and assume the risk it takes to pursue their passions and dreams. The risk you take may be financial, but more often than not, the risk involved is something more personal something more personal than money. And that is once more difficult, and yet it gets easier to overcome. And I'm talking about expectations, your own expectations, the expectations of others, your family, your friends, society's expectations. It takes the heart of an entrepreneur to overcome and break free of so many of those constraints. In my case, graduating with an art history degree, I chased down the job that I thought was most exciting to me. I applied to be an intern at Sotheby's, the auction house. By the time I applied, I was a full six months late and more than 200 applications had already applied for the internship and they had chosen the seven. But it didn't stop me. I knew I didn't have the odds with me, but it was a job that I wanted, so I kept calling and calling. And finally, believe it or not, one of the other applicants dropped out, and my perseverance paid off. I received a call back, went through the rigorous interview process, and I landed the position. So from the first no, that's when the door opens. When you, we, that's just the opening gambit. So when you receive a no, that's just the opening, okay, well, now the door's open, so you have time to receive the yes. So I wound up staying at Sotheby's for, for four years, giving it my all, and helping create a brand new customer service de department that's still in existence today. I did so well at the job that they offered me a job to run their international department, which meant traveling every week around the world for Sotheby's. It was a great offer, but my heart wasn't in it. At a certain point, I wanted to follow the direction in my heart, and at that point, it was to go into show business. My parents thought I was completely crazy. I had a, the most promising career in the art world and sitting in front of me, but I wanted to leave it behind. And maybe there are a few of you that, that harbored the dream of Hollywood. Um, it's such um, an alluring dream to have that kind of impact. Um, almost beyond belief, but what I soon discovered is that breaking into Hollywood isn't all that far-fetched if you're willing to work for it. I learned to never be afraid of using connections. Please listen to what I'm saying. Use every connection you can, whether it's from parents, friends, relatives, classmates. Use it all because it's you who have to walk through that door and succeed. Don't be afraid to turn any way you can for assistance in breaking into your chosen profession. And don't be afraid to use whatever experience you have to get in the door, no matter how bizarre. This was the case for me because my art history major and experience at Sotheby's landed me a job on a film. My role was as art consultant to a film called The Eyes of Laura Mars starring Faye Dunaway. I don't know if you ever heard of this film, but it was a pretty cool film. Um, and um, I began by um, suggesting the artistic images of the, f it was about a, um, an art dealer and I got the job of suggesting the images of the photographs that were used. They were so pleased with my work that I went on to do extras casting and I had to cast 
Calvin Klein and midgets for a party scene. But I was so happy I was in show business. I said, this is for me. Um, my biggest goal was to produce a movie, and I gave it my all no matter what obstacles were in, a way, in my way. I spent some time pulling together ideas and scripts and started pitching to major studios and put a number of films in development, but not one of the films got made. Um, one of the stories was a film, a female version of the film Animal House. Maybe you heard of that. And <laughs> it happened when I was at my first semester at University of Maryland. The dorm caught on fire. Well, there was this woman who was a pyromaniac who came into my room and started lighting matches. So it wasn't really good. But it gave me a great idea for a treatment for a film. And so soon I was talking to this girl that I had met in Hollywood and she, she said, well, let me help you write a treatment. And she wrote a treatment and little did I know, she registered the treatment with the Writers Guild without my name on it. And the next thing I knew there were lawsuits and whatever, but I spent, I sold the movie and I spent six months in, in a room with four um, SCTV um, improvisational actors like Shelley Long, who later went on to Cheers. Do you know who I'm talking about? Anyway, I laughed for six months, had the best time, learned about drama, and um, un unfortunately the film got scrapped, and then there was like a, a, a drama with the Writers Guild. Anyway, I was devastated, but that was just one of the projects that I developed that didn't get made, and I had um, this amazing opportunity, which was I got a call um, from a producer saying, would you like to produce a show in the West End of London? And I was so dejected and every bone in my body felt like I was broken from Hollywood that I got on the plane and went to London and produced a show called They're Playing Our Song. And I didn't know if I could do it, but all of a sudden I found out I had all these skills I didn't know. I could raise money. I had a good sense of drama. I knew when to keep my mouth shut. I had a lot of good skills for being a producer. So opening night, I remember the, the, um, the um, lead actor in it drove a car and the car didn't stop and crashed through the set. So I thought, oh my God. But then the newspapers in London all came out with, their playing our song was a crashing success. And so um, the lesson that I learned from that experience was you put all this energy in one place and somehow it pays off somewhere else. And until you go through that experience and you put your heart and soul into something, you don't realize how much benefit you're getting from it and how it will play out in other parts of your life. Um, in order to follow your passion, in order to follow your heart, in order to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to learn to use failure and disappointment to move forward. In fact, someone asked me, what do you attribute your success to? And I said, right decisions. Then they asked, how do you make right decisions? And I said, experience. Finally, they said, how do you get experience? And I said, wrong decisions. Your failures are just as important as your successes. All of the broken bones in Hollywood made me stronger, more able to face the challenges that I never even saw coming. Growing, learning, being prepared to tackle new opportunities when they, arri they arrive is absolutely one of the biggest keys to success you can ever develop. Um, well, uh, um, let me just... Um, um, so I went back to New York and started producing plays on Broadway. The first one was Crimes of the Heart, which won a Pulitzer Prize. Yet I was responsible for, you know, changing the cast. And um, I hired this actress called Holly Hunter and gave her her first role. But Crimes of the Heart is an ensemble piece. And Holly is such a big actress that she blew everyone off stage. So I was eating crow because this wonderful ensemble, which is a delicate balance, was now with this leading lady. And it would just, but you know, you learn, um, as you go, the very hard lessons of putting a team together that you carry forward into every venture. And it's a very delicate balance that you constantly have to oil and, and tinker with. Still, I was riding high on the heels of that show when I opened this fantastic comedy on Broadway called Noises Off. It was, out of, it was a show that I brought over from London and it was uproariously funny. 
And one night I got tickets to some, for some very famous people and met them at 21. And I was, I mean, I just was so excited. I had two shows running on Broadway. I was feeling my oats. I was just so happy. And I walked into 21 and sat down with Barbara Walters and Barbara Streisand and a few other famous people. And I, they looked at me and it was like a funeral dirge. I didn't know what happened. Now this show is, it's a comedy. And they had the longest faces, and I didn't know what to say. And finally, Barbara Walters looked at me and said, we didn't know if we should tell you, but we might as well tell you, we hated your show. I mean, I was like, talk about taking the wind out of your sail. Anyway, it turns out that in my absence, the cast had been sort of mugging on stage. You know, when you go to see a live production, it's different every day. And this was such a fun show that they would, they would have fun just playing with each other. And at a certain point, they, they got very, very broad with the comedy. And so I had to then start going back every night to kind of speak to the stage manager to try to you know, rein them in. So I tried to turn a negative into a positive. But it never gets easier, I can tell you. Um, the real story of my life that I, I think is just one of the most incredible stories is that I produced a show on Broadway called My One and Only, starring Tommy Toon and Twiggy. I don't know if you know who they are. But it was based on a Paramount film called Funny Face, and we used all the Gershwin music. And we hired this fellow called Peter Sellers, who was, a, who was he actually was a genius. He won a genius award from the MacArthur Foundation. So the, his idea of doing a musical was, why don't we try it without a microphone? And um, Anyway, that's not how you do Broadway musicals. So um, <laughs> we were in Boston, and the show was falling apart so badly that Tommy Toon would get on stage after the performance every night and apologize for the show. I mean, it was like a producer's nightmare. But I would go to his dressing room, and he'd look at me, and, and I'm dying out here. Please help me. Anyway. We immediately started revamping the show and did an entirely new version during the day while continuing to perform the old version by night. We, would we were determined to bring a great show to Broadway. But w right before we moved to um, Broadway, a reporter named Kevin Kelly sold a story to New York Magazine entitled Falling on Its Funny Face. And that big feature article um, told the world that this, my musical was a big fat flop. So um, we were a flop before we even had a chance to open. It was a flop, and there was no denying it. We did the math and realized that we had lost over 600000 and this is in 1985 in Boston, and that was a lot of money. But this was the case. I knew in my heart that there was an idea there that was really good, and um, I, I wound up spending a weekend on the phone with the heads of Paramount, Michael Eisner and Barry Diller, if those names mean anything to you. And we only got off the phone for that weekend to sleep and to eat, because the idea was how are we going to raise more money and put more money in the show. So we all decided we would put more money in the show. Where was I going to come up with this money? So I ended up having to borrow money from my father. Now, I can't tell you. He didn't want to hand over money easily to me, and he made me sign a promissory note that said that I would return the money within six months. The pressure was on. We, at this point, we fired everyone, the director, the book writer, the set designer, the lighting designer. The only one that didn't get fired was the costume designer. Um, we had Mike Nichols helping us, and he sort of stepped in, but he didn't want to get credited. And I started to feel a little better about the show. But here we were in previews, and I'd stand outside the theater, and people would walk by and go, did you read that article in New York Magazine? This show is a flop. This show is terrible. So why bother? Why are they doing it? So I would just be so nervous. And during intermission, the, the, um, in the lobby, the, the people would come and they'd say such terrible things that during intermission I would hide in the theater under one of the rows of seats because I couldn't take the noise. Anyway, the show finally opened and we stayed up all night waiting for the reviews and to hear our fate and the headline read, Miracle on 44th Street. We were a huge hit and we garnered many Tonys and it proved once and for all that following 
my passion, my heart would serve me well. And most importantly, I was able to pay my father back in six months. So going through the battering on the way to that success helped me in a way that would become increasingly useful in the coming years. It helped to make me feel almost bulletproof. It helped me to learn to block out rejection, to not be so crushed by criticism and failures that come with any success. Um, even with all my accomplishments on Broadway, I still felt the call of Hollywood. I still had that dream of making a movie that would make a difference in the world. So despite everyone else's expectations, despite most of my friends think I was totally nuts, despite protests from my family, I left Broadway, jumped back into film, and went back to Hollywood. The difference now, of course, was that I had more show business experience in my pocket, more contacts, more sense of confidence that I needed to truly get the job done. I also had something new going for me. Um, I decided I had an additional goal, which is to make social issue movies that shed light on important subjects. I dreamt that I could make films that could actually do some good in the world. Having that focus, that additional past me, passion helped me in unimaginable ways. The first film I ever produce, produced was called Prison Stories, Women on the Inside, about an HBO film about mothers in prison and the children they left behind. My aim for that film back in 1990 was to use a female director, a female crew, and the whole project put together with women at the helm. It was a radical idea at the time, but I believe um, it really worked. And um, we all, I took all the actresses and everyone to prison to meet the inmates and to get really invested in the social issue because 85% of the women in prison are mothers and no one ever thinks of what happens to the children that they left behind. Anyway, um, we had a premiere of the film and there was a small problem. It was the day that war broke out with Israel. It was, you know, 1991. And um, we had a buffet laid out at the American Film Institute and nobody came. And it was like, it just like, imagine the image of this huge buffet of food and no one to eat it. People stayed home and I just thought, you know, I, here I put so much energy and effort into making my first movie, nobody came. But it was, the fiasco turned out to be nothing more than the dark, darkest before dawn. This little film about a serious subject, this little film that almost no one had confidence in but me, aired on HBO and instantly became one of the network's top rated films of all time. They couldn't even believe the numbers. It was a huge success and it wound up being nominated for ACE Awards. And um, seeing the, f the effect that the socially conscious film lit sparked me from that point and I decided to, to focus all my passion on working on social issues. Um, that film was used to change laws in w women's prisons in California and it was used as evidence and still used as a teaching tool in women's prisons. So, um, but don't think for one second that I was on easy street. No way, that Hollywood road was still broken, bump and, and bumpy. The road was the same. It was me who had changed. For every film that I got made, I want you to listen to this, I had 10 films in development that didn't get made. Um, I didn't let my failures stop me. I didn't let my successes stop me either. I learned that you can't be too disappointed or too excited, but instead you keep moving forward like a shark. Otherwise the highs and lows could be so dramatic that you'd get incredibly depressed or manic depressive high as a kite and ready to die the next. What I learned about Hollywood is you could die of encouragement. In other words, you'd pick up the phone and they'd go, we love your script, it's the greatest script, we'll get back to you. And then I'd wonder, what just happened? Did I, buy, did I sell it? Am I making the movie? And it was just lip service, so. I also learned to follow the lesson of General George Patton. General Patton said, a decent plan executed today is better than a perfect plan executed tomorrow. I saw that to be the case in one film that I loved. I had this idea to do um, a film on the Trail of Tears, the kind of the American Holocaust story where Andrew Jackson moved the Cherokee Nation, um, the most educated of all the Native Americans from North Carolina to Oklahoma. And this force marched 
caused tens of thousands of deaths in the, in the Cherokee Nation. It was like an American Holocaust. And at the time, Turner Films, I don't know if you remember Turner, um, TNT was doing a whole series on Native Americans. And here I had the Cherokee Indian story and I thought this was the jewel of the crown. So I sold it to Turner and we developed the story and we kept working on the script and working on the script and working with the writers and making it perfect. By the time the script was perfect, we went back into TNT and they said, I'm terribly sorry, we've decided not to do any more Native American stories. So I hope I can stress this point with you that you know, it's better if it's a little imperfect and you get it done than you wait till it's perfect. I don't know, does anyone in this room know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. As I said, it never gets easier. Um, that can be said of many careers, including the career of social entrepreneur, and I'd like to show you the trailer of this film, Shot Through the Heart, if it's possible. We may not be able to, but. No? No, the, um, on here? Is that, is that the start? Yeah. Of, is that the start? Yeah. Okay. Well, even if it isn't, it's okay. Okay. Got it. Now, a war. You can show me your pips. I don't want to show you anything. Yes, Threatens to divide their homeland. Have you been called up? I will tomorrow. And loved ones. I have nothing to do with that. Perhaps you should have. Then you could tell your commanding officer to take his tanks off our hillsides. I don't like guns pointing at me. Some idiot might set one off. And two friends forced onto opposing sides. You can't get sucked into all this stuff, Kong. They call me Muslim. They call you Serb. Why, Yugoslav? must face the ultimate test. What they got you doing, uh, training kids to shoot on us? You have to get out. Shot location in Bosnia and Eastern Europe. We will not be frightened out of our home. Miss Volkov Danish, the best shooter in Yugoslavia. I can't leave now. I need it here. It's a sniper. They're going to fall in. Shooting to the It's not possible. I couldn't do it. You find these motherfuckers, Vago. You should take my job, go. What if it's a trap? Oh, Can we the HBO Pictures presents Linus Roach. I'm sure it's so sorry. Vincent Perez. You know the most important thing in the world to me is that you, my darling, that you are safe. One friendship, one war, one shot. Isn't that why you're here to kill me? Why didn't you shoot me up in the head? So that film was called Shot Through the Heart and focused on the war in Sar Sarajevo, another sad battle played right on uh, the doorstep where neighbors fought against neighbors. Um, many of you were just born when this war happened and um, uh, you know, I was very pleased to work on a film like this and we shot in Sarajevo and um, the film went on to win the Peabody Award and I was really proud of this film and I was very proud that Bill Clinton saw the film the night before he came out with his policy on, on uh, Kosovo. So um, it was um, through the making of Shot Through the Heart that I first became aware of the horrors that unfolded in Rwanda. Had I not made Shot Through the Heart, this woman would, wouldn't have come to me with this wonderful article about a healthcare worker who went to Rwanda and um, fell in love with a Rwandan man and the maelstrom of war broke out and you know I was so moved by her story and um, I spent the next eight and a half years developing this film and trying to get it made. It was called A Hundred Days of Darkness. We had A-list actors attached. We had Jaiman Hansu and Helen Hunt. We had an incredible script um, and an incredible director, Shaker Kapoor. And that film turned into yet another failure. Um, a film called Hotel Rwanda came out and Hollywood basically said, we don't want to do two films about the Rwanda genocide, who would care? So after eight and a half years um, and trying three times and I almost got it made, I decided that I couldn't, I had to put it on the shelf. 
and yet I had learned so much about Rwanda, so much about the women in Rwanda, I decided that there must be something I could do. And the more I studied it, I found out 56% of the parliament are made up of women, that President Kagame believed that in order to have peace in his country, women needed to be part of the public policy. And um, the population at that time was 70% women because so many of the men were killed. Anyway, um, this led me to a great entrepreneurial change in my entire career. I decided to follow my heart once more and this time it was to move away from dealing with social issue films and to start tacking social issues on the ground in real life. I decided to become a full-time social entrepreneur and that's how I founded Same Sky. If my peers thought I was crazy to leave Broadway, well, the art world, Broadway, and then Hollywood, you should have heard them when I put movie making aside to help women in Rwanda. Are you out of your mind, they would say. What are you doing? Even though many thought it was a noble and that's very nice, you'll get over this soon. Why are you going all the way to Rwanda? Anyway, I'll tell you this, they don't know what good drugs I'm taking. I'm taking the drug of following my heart, following my passion, and doing something I know I'm supposed to be doing in life. There is no reward that can compare to, to doing something in your life where you feel like you're helping someone for the better. The currency of making a difference has a big rate of emotional return. It turns out that everything that I had done in my career, failures and successes included, prepared me to run this business that puts people first. I learned about beauty and art at school and at Sotheby's. I learned about selling and raising money in the art world and expanded that knowledge through, through the London West End and producing in Broadway and Hollywood. I learned about business contracts, working internationally, and most of all, I learned about the power of compelling stories and compelling stories to do good. Um, all through my evolving combination of career choices, if I hadn't put myself out there and pursued my passions, I may never require the wide variety of skills that I now use every day in order to help the women of Rwanda help themselves. So that's my message today to each of you. Don't be afraid to be an entrepreneur. Don't be afraid to follow your passion. Don't be afraid to follow your heart. And don't be afraid to ask yourself that important question, what am I supposed to be doing in this life? And you're going to have to ask it over and over again because sometimes it changes. And don't be afraid, especially as that answer evolves, the more you embrace it, the more you live it, the better your life will become. The amazing thing that I found is that the harder I work, the luckier I get, the more passionate you are in your pursuits, the more true you are to your heart, the more surprised and inspired you'll be by your own life's journey. And when you're doing all that, you just might find that your true passion lies in helping other people to make their lives better too. Once again, don't be afraid to take this extraordinary lucky life that each and every one of us has to make the most of it to your heart's content. For if every one of us followed our hearts, just imagine the beautiful positive change we could bring into the world. Thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Any questions? Yes? Um, what do you see in like, the future endeavors? Like, do you like to run another social justice kind of uh, or do you see yourself going in a completely different direction? You know what? I really think that I, um, I think that I want to make Same Sky a kind of a global brand and work with, um, you know, to eradicate poverty and, and empower women. I think that if I had, um, you know, if I can, that I'd like to see Same Sky all over the world, whether it be in India or in any place where there, there are women who have suffered and really need, you know, a hand up to become entrepreneurs. I don't believe completely in the aid model. I believe in trade. 
I believe that if you give someone dignity in a job, that it, it transforms their lives. But if you give them aid, and there's a book about this written by Dambiza Moza called Dead Aid. And in the book, she talks about the fact that in Africa today, the countries that took aid are in worse shape now than before they took the aid. It's kind of like the welfare system. So I really believe that I can, if I can do women empowerment, that, that it will interest me for the next 20 years. Yes. How do you actually choose the two dozen women that you employ? How do you go about doing that? Well, I, right now I'm working with three collectives, and we have many more than two dozen. But it started out with my first partner in Rwanda. And she found um, the women. And one of them had been trained by this AIDS activist to crochet. And she then taught the other women. Then I went to um, the First Lady of Rwanda's collective that started with 50 widows. And one of them also had been trained by this AIDS activist, and she started to train the others. And then um, I've just started a collective in Zambia, in Lusaka, Zambia, where one in seven people have, are suffering with HIV. And they're fantastic at crocheting. They're unbelievable. So we're, we're, we're moving quickly through. So, yes? I'm teaching a social entrepreneurship and microfinance course right now, and so the students and I have been reading quite a bit about social entrepreneurs, um, and obviously you're working through the collectives of women in Rwanda, I have a bit one myself. Um, my question is, are you transferring any business skills to the women, are the women being trained to understand the business model behind what they're doing? And do you have some way of measuring what the real success is behind the model? Well, a number of the women that have worked for me, um, that are working for me, have started their own entrepreneurial ventures. One started a coal business where she imports coal. Another one financed a potato business with her own daughter, which um, they import potatoes from 150 miles away. A third one hired a woman to go in her village to sell household goods while she crochets. Now, I learned that not all the women that work for me are entrepreneurs. Some of them feel much safer just having a job and you know, knowing they get a salary. So I had read um, Banker to the Poor and spent time with Muhammad Yunus, who believes that everyone is a born entrepreneur. And I have seen with my own eyes that it's not exactly the case from the women that I've met. But the ones that are have gone on, and the other ones, um, you know, I hope one day to give them more education and more skills, business skills, you know, to maybe go into the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Program or do a partnership with Women for Women or people that have been on the ground longer than I have to help them with uh, reading and writing and, and different skills. Well, the children are doing phenomenally well. You heard on the film that you know sleeping in a mattress makes the big difference for them. Having a uniform to wear to school, they feel like the other kids. Many of the kids are HIV positive and have suffered unbelievable, you know, losses through the genocide. They've lost their parents and 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 whatever. But you know, the kids are the the greatest success story because if you educate the kids, the chances in Rwanda of another genocide are mitigated because you're giving education and economic empowerment and a potential for a future, so. And, and Jeff, you have a business around the world. How important is it to have a local partner and how do you go about finding a local partner? Well, I mean, it's trial and error with a local partner and you just do your best because you can't be everywhere but you definitely need a local partner and you know again you have to take a leap of faith so um, until you're kind of in bed with them you don't know exactly um, but the most important thing to me is that I know how much I pay each woman and I know that the women get the money and they get a hot meal and they get um, a hot meal to take their HIV medication 
and I've seen the, cha the changes of the women where they went from 80 T cells to 800 and their health has changed so dramatically. And to me, that's the most important thing is to make sure the women physically get the money so I could, you know, I, I know that I'm paying them as opposed to sometimes in a charitable situation or an NGO model, you never know how much actually gets to the people, but if I pay them per bracelet, then I know they're getting paid, and that's the most important thing. Yes? Um, I was kind of curious about the uh, mechanics of how um, the actual business runs. I mean, do, when you have, do you, after the women learn how to crochet, um, do you just kind of like set them free and see however many you can produce, that's how many you produce, or um, do you have a, you know, a quota that you try to meet? Well, you know, to me, the most important thing you can give the women is an opportunity to sell. What happens is people are on the ground training, and no one gives them an opportunity to sell. And um, I think you've seen it in Tunisia just a couple of weeks ago with an educated population with no jobs. And the, our model is very much the marketing um, end of being able to have them crochet bracelets, but also to be able to market it. And so we've had a lot of celebrities wearing our bracelets, and we sell them online, and we sell them, you know, at DKNY and on, at Bergdorf's on the fifth floor, and at Wynn Hotels, and all these different retailers. Um, and uh, it's just very important that we continue to create the market so the women have continuous work and sustainability, that's what the model is, you know. So it's, it's more than the training and it's more than getting them the beads, it's just putting so much energy into the selling and the marketing of, um, of, of the bracelets. Yes? Yes, how much do you use social media tools like Facebook and Twitter? Tons, you, I mean, you kids have such an advantage, I can't even tell you. I do my best to Twitter and Facebook, but you have such an advantage because this comes so naturally and easy to you, and you know how to do this in such an organic way. So let me tell you, there are so many people out there like me who aren't as savvy as you are with the social media world, and you can trade on those skills with your eyes closed. So. Don't forget to trade on those skills. We need you, so it's great. I'm so happy you asked that question. Yes? How much do women actually make? The women make 15 to 20 times the average wage in sub-Sahara Africa. So what are the implications for that? Well, some have actually moved out of um, government housing Another was able to move out of an abusive relationship to their own home. The women can afford a hot meal for breakfast. They can buy clothes for their kids. They can, I mean, it's, they open bank accounts. They have health insurance. I, the implications are just incredible. Don't forget most of the women or all the women are HIV positive. The government in Rwanda gives them fee, an, free antiviral drugs. But those drugs are so strong, unless you have a hot meal, you can't function. And so many of the women, and I have the film of the women speaking, when they started and when I first met them, they were so thin and so unhealthy, and they didn't have the energy to go and get the antiviral drugs. And if they did, they couldn't afford the hot meal they needed to take the drug. So it's just, the change is so dramatic. Yes? You know, I think transitions are so important, and I just want you to know that in, your, in life, and I hope I stress this in my speech, you don't get supported for making these life changes and, and transitions. 
people don't want you to do that. People want you to be one thing. They don't want you to be five different things. You do not get supported, but we leave, live in a time where we're accelerated. We're exposed to a lot. We continually change. We care about different things. And it's very important to stay you know, in tune with your feelings. Um, what happened when um, uh, my film, 100 Days of Darkness, didn't get made, um, I made one or two films after that, but the, the, the world of the television movie and the feature film had changed so dramatically with reality programming coming in. And I saw that change in front of me. It was, it was in living color and I said, why am I beating my head against the wall trying to swim upstream? Kind of like the eye of the needle in the haystack. Not, not the needle in the haystack anymore. And I said, I need to do something where I can you know, live the story and see if I can make a difference on the ground. So that's how I evolved into that. But I feel like um, I don't regret giving up Hollywood. I feel like you're right. I'm now part of the story and I'm loving every min minute of, as the story unfolds. Because to me, it's like I, do, I, I uh, uh, you know, um, found oil it's an, it just it never stops gushing it never stops leading me i wouldn't be at villanova had i not created same sky so you know it's just wonderful the byproducts of doing this are just it's endlessly rewarding and exciting to me and has opened so many worlds for me so i really encourage you to take that leap of faith if you can because you don't know where it will lead and it's just you know, we only have one life and, you know, it's just such a great thing to try. I'm not saying it's easy, but I just, I really think if you can do it, do it. Any other questions? Thank you, Francine. You're so welcome. Thank you. I want, I want to thank Francine for coming to Villanova today and for her husband, Rick, coming as well and for sharing her time and her talent with us. Um, so much of what you do with Same Sky is, is very much in line with who we are at Villanova. St. Thomas of Villanova, who was our patron, was dedicated his life to serving the poor and the marginalized. And to that end, um, thanks to the generosity of Mr. Azrak, we would like to make a gift to Same Sky. This is not it, though. It will be in the Thank form you. of a check, which I actually don't have right okay. now. But I will be sending The check is in the mail. The check is and so um, we want to really endorse what you're doing and hope that it will help these women empower them. And this is just a small token of our appreciation for spending some time with us today. Thank so you. Thank and Madonna, you. I have a present for you too. Oh, no. I brought Madonna a Same Sky bracelet signed by Sada, who um, I, can, I can show you her picture here. Thank you. So wow. the bracelets come with the signature of the artisan, and many of the artisans are on the website, and you can send them an email. Oh, and beautiful thing. I love jewelry, by the way. <laughs> Those who know me know that. So here is the Thank bag. So and much. inside so the bag is um, Sada's story oh, and a nice. picture of Sada. Great. Who, by the way, when I first met her, I went, Sada! And she looked at me, and she went, Sada. Sada. And I went... Sada! And she goes, no, Sada. <laughs> and it was like, I just, it well, took me you. a long time to pronounce her name correctly, but and she's. any of you are interested in purchasing these bracelets or others that um, Francine is wearing, there are little uh, cards on the table outside. Visit the samesky.com website and, and you can purchase your own bracelets. And so please become our fan on Facebook and. And Twitter. And Twitter, yeah. Thank you please. so much for attending. All right, thank you.